A little bit ago, I was contacted by libertarianforums.com and quite rudely and said we have a thing for your idiocy and whatnot. So I thought perhaps a proper way to respond to these individuals was to create something, create a series of videos that would, in essence, debunk libertarianism. And some of my own people have been asking me for a while to, to do something like this. So I'm going to go ahead and create a series of videos debunking a lot of the ideas behind libertarianism and why it's not an actual you know, economic school of thought. So this first video, I'm going to deal with a lot of the common arguments that are made. They're not economic theory or stuff like that. That will be in later videos. And then in another video, I'll deal with the criticisms that have been made of Marx by libertarians. So I'm going to start with just uh, just some of the, the main criticisms for that libertarians actually make. When the Founding Fathers wrote the Constitution, they didn't actually agree on very much. If you try to appeal to what they really meant, you can't. Each of them had tons of different ideas on everything. The Constitution itself is a compromise of ideas among men who actually wrote it. There was no pure form by which the Founding Fathers actually meant anything. On top of that, each history writer has his or her different opinion on what each Founding Father actually believed. Different authors and researchers have a different opinion on what each Founding Father's opinion was. In some cases, it can be known exactly, but that doesn't mean it was agreed upon by all those who wrote the Constitution. The Founding Fathers knew they couldn't predict all situations that would arise. Or that the country, or what the country would be like in a hundred years. This is why they explicitly said that any such controversy should be sent to the courts to be cited, decided upon. The interpretation of the laws is the proper and peculiar province of the courts. The Constitution is, in fact, and must be regarded by the judges as a fundamental law. It therefore belongs to them to ascertain its meaning as well as the meaning of any particular act proceeding from the legislative body. The Constitution is intended as a guide, not a literal set of laws that must be followed like the Bible. They were all aware that contradictions would arise, along with all the other events that they couldn't predict. Not only that, Thomas Jefferson knew the Constitution would change over time to meet the realities of the future. Some men look at constitutions with sanctimonious reverence, and they deem them like the Ark of the Covenant, too sacred to be touched. They ascribe to the men of the preceding age a wisdom more than human, and suppose what they did to be beyond amendment. Laws and institutions must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind. As that becomes more developed, more enlightened, as new discoveries are made, institutions must advance also to keep pace with the times. We might, we might as well require a man to wear still the coat which fitted him when he was a boy as a civilized society to remain forever under the regimen of their barbarous ancestors. The Declaration of Independence is a rhetorical document. It has no legal power whatsoever. The Founders never intended to be one that had any precedent in law. They made it this way on purpose. If it is supposed to be the intent of the men, then you can easily see they changed their minds when they wrote the Articles of Confederation and then the Constitution. If somebody wants to take it as a philosophy, then they should make a good argument, not admiration for the Founders. The opinion of what is right will vary greatly among individuals. Very few people view their rights as being as libertarians define them. For example, I believe food and housing are rights that every person in the world should have no matter what, along with the freedom to challenge private property. Libertarians adamantly disagree with this statement, thus they do not defend my freedom or rights. In fact, they are a direct threat to them. They cannot claim to defend my freedom or rights, as they have never done so. Historically, there have been institutions that have done a good deal of work to defend my freedoms, like various human rights lawyers, uh, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, most importantly, my own actions inside court engaging in lawsuits against the state. There are far better, more historically effective groups to join that will defend a person's right. 
The ACLU is constantly challenging forces that contradicts a person's rights. They claim to take on 6,000 cases a year free of charge and claim their, their involvement in 80% of the landmark Supreme Court cases since 1920. Property is theft. The idea that a person can declare something to be property and threatens anyone who tries to use it. Where does that person get the right to stop someone else from using it? Uh, there will be so-called arguments about mixing labor with resources. That is, in essence, first come, first serve. Um, this is a rightful justification of taxes as it presumes that the government holds all natural resources and trust. Also, taxation is part of the social contract. The tax is a payment for the use of government goods and services. They are not initiating force. They are enforcing the social contract. This men with guns argument is no different than any private contract. If you violate the terms of a private contract, men with guns will come and enforce it through the seizure of property or the seizure of funds or the seizure of the self. Now, this is no different in Marxist theory. Engels said the state, in the final analysis, is nothing other than a body of armed men. Marxism only challenges who the state serves the interests of. The social contract everyone is a part of is the laws and the constitution. You originally are placed in this contract by your parents by choosing your residency and or citizenship at birth. They are contracting for you as a minor until you, and you're signed until you're 18. Then you have the choice of renouncing your citizenship. Yes, there's legal precedent for doing this and leaving the country. All people who immigrate to America sign this agreement to contract via an oath of citizenship, swearing to uphold the laws and constitution, and residency permits. Agreeing to the social contracts is a part of obtaining the permit. People are again required to swear an oath to that contract when they take political office or join the military. This contract, like many, stand until it is explicitly revoked. Sometimes libertarians will make a big deal out of not having to sign a contract. Well, this is like going to a restaurant, eating food, and then not paying for it because you didn't sign a contract. Even if it is a restaurant with a minimum charge and they haven't ordered anything. The restaurant gets to set the price and the method of contract so that even your presence creates a debt. This is not true at all. It is similar to buying a condominium. In doing so, you have the ability to enter or leave or persuade others to vote along with you. You have a vote in the condo board elections like you have with the government now. You have the option of running for the condo board president. Being a part of the condo, you pay fees for the services provided by it. There are other such contracts in use, like those with utilities, like electricity and water. They have a contract in which they tell you ahead of time that the rates are going to increase. And with that, you can choose either to end the service or pay the new rate. Insurance is similar to this, except that rates may be regulated by the government. It claims that since the social contract is like no other, then it does not it is not a contract at all. This is a non sequitur. A unique feature of a contract does not mean that it is not a contract. This argument claims that the contract is completely unjust because different people and businesses are required to pay different amounts in taxes. Thus, it is unfair. This is no different than insurance rates, which can vary from individual to individual, and premiums would also be the case. The U.S. Constitution is a contract of several different parties, all three branches of government the states and citizens. All parties in the contract are subject to enforcement by other parties in the contract. This is checks and balances. It was designed this way on purpose to deal with precisely this fairness issue. No different than if you change your mind about the lease on an apartment. You don't own the apartment and you don't own the country. You may own property in the apartment or the country, but you do not own it yourself. Libertarians will frequently claim that this is a love it or leave is a kind of coercion. Uh, this is not. There is a difference between having a choice and having to leave. The condominium, for example, no matter how much you love it or feel like you can change it, you still have the option to leave. 
No matter how good or how bad, you have the choice. You always have the choice to try and change things with the voting power as well. You may not always be able to change the things that you don't like, but that's because you don't own the country, because it's not entirely yours. You have at least four choices. Tolerate the social contract and perhaps try to amend it. Leave it by emigrating. Violate it. Or you could theoretically revolt. Sometimes in their weaker moments, libertarians resort to asking why they can't just be left alone by the government. They are not coerced into accepting the U.S. government services any more than they are coerced into rent or to purchase a place to live. If pretty much all territory is owned by the government, and pretty much all houses and apartments are owned, basically they're asking for a free lunch. Yes, you can immigrate. Just because... Just as you could buy a different car, and even though your favorite car company doesn't produce cars which let you travel at the speed of sound and get 20,000 miles per gallon, even if nobody produces exactly what you want, you can choose any other car on the market that's produced, or you can create one yourself. There are roughly 200 nations which you could emigrate to. They are the product of, you know, they are the product of an anarcho-capitalist free market. There is no over-government dictating to those sovereign nations. Indeed, the only difference between the anarchy of nations and libertopia is that anarcho-capitalists are wishing for a smaller granularity. These nations have found that it is most cost-efficient to defend themselves territorially. If any other market uh, provided 200 choices, libertarians would declare that the sacred workings of the market blessed them with whatever choices were offered. The point is that the choices do exist. It's up to the libertarians to show that there is something wrong with the market of nations in a way that would that they would accept being applied to markets within nations. Libertaria is a combination of values that just don't exist. The government equivalent of a really posh residence for very little money. You can find nations which have much lower taxes, just don't expect them to be first class. And the reason these combinations don't exist is probably simple. The free market of government services essentially guarantees that there is no such thing as a free lunch that libertarians want. It's not competitive. This is a common claim by libertarians that paying tax to the state is the same thing as the mafia killing you or breaking your legs. Uh, they think that this argument is strong because it is territorial in nature. However, libertarians consider the contractual rent of land by owners, which is also fundamentally territorial, ethical, and consider coercion of squatters by those owners ethical. The key difference is who owns what. The mafia doesn't own anything to contract about. The landowner owns the land, in the limited sense. And the U.S. government owns the rights to govern its territory. These rights are a form of property, uh, much as mineral rights are a form of property. Now, let's not confuse them with the rights of individuals. Thus, the social contract can be required by the territorial property holder, the USA. To achieve this, you would basically have to ignore all of history. The government has all kinds of ways of proving ownership rights. Treaty, purchase, bequeathment by the original colonies and some other states, and conquest. This is exactly the same thing for owning any property. This is a very common argument and they consider it to be their most powerful. Commonly it is said that they hold the deed and paid the money for the property. What they hold is property as recognized by a government. That's what gives the documentation behind such a purchase or uh, purchase or paper of ownership any power. Without it being recognized by the state, legally, it doesn't mean anything. Limitations also exist in private transactions as well. For example, property is often sold uh, without water rights or timber rights. Property can also be sold with easements, like giving the neighbor permission to cross it to reach the road. Property can be can, property can be sold with limitations on its use. For example, the the uh, Adirondack State Park was bequeathed to the people of New York State with the stipulation that it remain forever wild. These all exist when purchasing a property in a country. 
when you purchase it, you are taking all those conditions along with it, like the right the government has to tax and zone property, limitations to ownership of navigate, navigatable waters, how far the property extends to the water, etc. A good example of easement is in the Fourth Amendment, which says the government can enter your property with a valid search warrant. And sometimes new limitations are specified, such as a non-ownership of airspace above property. Denying the easements of the government in a purchase is no different than ignoring the easements in a private contract. There are other limita uh, limitations as well. Despite owning the property right, uh, so to pollute the air and the water, doesn't exist, as they, they, they don't belong to the person who purchased the property, that you do not have a title to. Also consider negative externalities. A right a mall owner has to terminate the lease if a renter was causing damage. The same thing applies to the government when protecting wetlands and trying to prevent other ecological destruction. Besides all of this, can also be questioned with what makes you think you own anything. This is another case of libertarians uh, look at things in a vacuum and not acknowledging how these are all systems of phenomenon that interact with other systems of phenomenon. To my knowledge, only dialectical materialism understands this properly. When employers affect workers' wages, they affect the public's ability to purchase goods and services. Libertarianism it typically pretends that there's no correlation between them. Here is what I mean. If taxes are eliminated, you'll need to purchase the services that were formerly provided by the government. If taxes are eliminated, the economics of wages has changed, and the wages will change as well. Here's an example of the second one. I'm self-employed. My pay would absolutely positively go up 15% tomorrow if I wasn't paying FICA Medicare, but only briefly. Standard uh, microeconomic theory applies just as well to someone selling labor as someone selling widgets. If FICA disappeared, your competitors in the market to sell labor would be attracted to the higher wages and would sell more labor. This increase in the supply of labor drive down your wage from the 15% increase. You'd earn more per hour, but less than 15% more. It's an easy one to make, trying to invoke images of a time no one alive remembers. There's all kinds of holes in this one, like the unequal protection under the law for black people and Native Americans, or that women themselves were property. To make matters worse, it was directly ignoring the conditions people worked in only 100 or even 80 years ago. Safety measures at work were non-existent, and deaths and illness were, were common which is why workers fought so hard to get regulations and safety precautions. They seem to project this idea that people who sacrificed so much so that we didn't have to live so horribly were evil status that just conspired to take people's money away. However, to get to the core of the argument, they say the federal government had less control back then. Yes, it certainly did. But the state governments had even more power. There is little difference at all. The only really being income tax. There is not one class of positive duty or obligation in the U.S. today that did not exist 200 years ago at the state or federal level. In fact, the federal state did good in restructuring things like the state religious authority, which does violate the Constitution. Also, society uh, organized quite differently before the Industrial Revolution spread to the U.S. Our nation of shopkeepers was actually a nation of farmers. Uh, the means of production were controlled primarily by the workers, who were the owners of the farms and shops, meaning they owned their own stuff more often than were employed in them. Uh, government of the era would be out of place today as the tariffs and scientific knowledge of that era. This claims that the whole principle of the state is force, and that is what makes it right. That's not correct. What might makes the ability to make something. It does not matter if it is right or wrong. All property is defended on the same principle as well. Someone trespasses on your property, you call the cops, public or private, or you shoot the guy yourself, as in the libertarian preferred way of enforcement. Property came into existence through the use of violence. It is also defended that way. Nobody is beholden to your notions of what constitutes your property. Property is just as involuntary as a social contract. There is no moral obligation for anyone to respect your property, only a practical one. 
Marxism says, the state is a body of armed men whose job it is to defend private property. Now, this is almost the same thing. Why are you such a communist? This is another way of saying they want to live and screw over everyone they want and not even have to care that other people exist. But we have that already. They're called sociopaths. It's mostly whining about the regulation of behavior that keeps human beings actually being human beings. This comes off as little more than a full-grown adult complaining like a 14-year-old who doesn't want to do their homework. This part is only intended to deal with theory aspects of libertarianism. There will be more parts to this in the future, such as famous quotations libertarians use, economic arguments, and criticisms of Karl Marx. Please stay tuned for those.